Gerald Everett Jones is the author of the art history novel, Bonfire of the Vanderbilts. Find help for self-published authors and free podcasts at getpublishedradio.com. My research sources, yes, of course. Start at your public library. You've got this magic called interlibrary loan. It's not as needed these days with, when everything's available online, but in fact, not everything's available online, especially copies of rare books, and I'll show you how you can find those. Specialized research libraries like Redwood Library in Newport, I mean, find out in the area, geographic area you're talking about, or in the subject area you're talking about, there are going to be specialized institutes, research libraries, genealogical, you know, whatever. Church and diocese ar archives. If, if it involves births and deaths or marriages or baptisms or anything that would be documented in the church, churches employ archivists. They have nothing to do but answer questions from people like you. So there probably won't be a charge from a church, but if you can get somebody on the inside helping you, they're going to think this is the most fun they've had with their clothes on because that's really all they can do. Other researchers' files... I hooked up with one art historian who had hit a brick wall. She had published her own book on a different subject than this, and she said, well, would you like my research? Sure. And the next week, a carton showed up, Federal Express. I had f this many files. I had all of her PhD thesis files that I borrowed and copied. I mean, I did return them, but I had everything that she'd st spent six years. I had a whole box. The painter's heirs, yeah, I, uh, again, through genealogy, you can figure out who might be the living descendants of the people that you're talking about. And again, you're gonna, you know, if you can go see them, fine, interview them on the phone. The guy that I happened to find was Julius Stewart's grandnephew, lived in Atlanta. It turned out he was a family historian. He had a box full of photos. Some of the photos that I've shown you came from that box. Other researchers had interviewed him, but evidently they had not listened too closely. The Vanderbilt family and friends, I did correspond with Albert, uh, Alfred Vanderbilt III. Everybody says, you know, you're full of crap. Ancestry.com, you probably know about this, but this was originally the Mormon archives. You used to have to go to Salt Lake City in the basement and, and look at the microfilm. Now it's almost all online, and they've hooked up with everybody, military records, steamship records. I tried to find steamship passages. Turned out most of these people in, Vanderbilt, in, in Vanderbilt's time, the ones that were in the 1%, and even Julia Stewart was very wealthy. The painter was a sugar planter's son. So they had slaves in Cuba after it was possible to have slaves here for 20 years, okay? He was as rich as he could be. They never took steamships. They took private yachts. And if they didn't have a private yacht, they'd hitch a ride on somebody else's. So you're not going to find records of them going back and forth. And people say, oh, Julia Stewart was never here. Well, if you talk to his grandnephew, they, their relatives had, had a place in Newport, and he visited regularly. Now, there's no documentation of his having been at that ceremony, because I, I tried to find it. But you know, the idea that he didn't know anything about Newport, that's BS, i got to tell you. OK, recommended resources. A cool thing about Google Books, because they, they scanned all this old stuff from libraries, is you can do a full, you can type an entire sentence in. And if you've got it literally right, it'll show you the page in the book that that sentence is. It won't let you read the whole book, but it'll, it'll show you that page. Well, if you're doing a historical citation in your bibliography, and you got some old thing that nobody had the, attributed the source. My father did a, a book on uh, biblical archaeology. Well, he was, he was gone at that point. I, w I wasn't able to ask him where he got the quote. I type it into Google. I had my reference. So I documented all his quotes just by going to Google Books. Gutenberg.org, before you buy an old text, make sure that it hasn't been digitized already and is free. It has an ebook format, not Kindle. Google Scholar has unpublished and published doctoral theses. So this is stuff that, won't you find in books? But man, you would be surprised some of the topics that some of these PhD candidates write on. Amazon Marketplace, of course, you know, there's no reason anymore if you can't find it in a library, maybe you can find it as a used book. If it's something you really need, you know, pay for it as a used book and, you know. Libris is another seller of, online seller of rare and used books. A lot of these book, online booksellers will do a book a search for you, even if they don't have the book they'll put out their feelers to people to see if they have it. Reference books, you really want to get a feeling 
for what it was like to live then in very practical day-to-day -day terms. Now, this is just a scattering because, you know, Manchester, a world lit, lit, lit only by fire. I actually tended bar for him once upon a time. He, uh, Kennedy's biographer. But uh, lesser known work, he wrote about everything up to the invention of electricity. So he was telling you what it was like when everything was absolutely pitch black at night. So he's given you daily life stuff. Uh, daily in the life of ancient Rome, just what it says. You've got some surveys, study of history, story of civilization, the history of the modern world. Uh, actually, H.G. Wells did a book called The Outline of History. The one I really like is Grun, The Timetables of History. And it tells you, it shows you in graphic form how some of these cultures cr crossed over. So what was going on in Turkey at the same time that this was going on in America? If, do you have a character who's going between here and Turkey? Okay, you're not gonna be able to see those connections unless you can you know, consult something like this. But here's what I want you to think about, and it's, it's more important to have this planet. Again, it's about curiosity, it's about close observation, but how did they fill in the blank? For your characters, you wanna answer, how did they travel? How did they shelter? What were their houses like? How did they communicate? Did they have phones? Did they have, okay, did you know the difference between a radiogram a telegram and a cablegram? In the 1890s, it was very important. If you were on a ship, you got a radiogram. If you were in Europe, and between U US and Europe, it went over the transatlantic cable as a cablegram. If it was local and there, you didn't have a telephone, it was a telegram, okay? Or a courier, you know, handwritten note. That happened a lot, still happened a lot. How did they speak? What was their slang? You know, you could read literature of the time, a lot of novelists you know, can capture the argot, whatever, that's not really taught, especially if you got, you know, how many flavors of cockney. What did they eat? Especially if you go back far enough in time, fresh vegetables couldn't be preserved. I mean, even in my grandmother's day, you know, her whole basement lined with, with jars of vegetables she'd canned in the, in the, in the wintertime. I mean, they didn't have frozen food? No, they didn't have frozen food. You know, good, duh. And the other thing is, how long did it take? How long did it take for anything? And that really figures into your story. Okay, at 1890s, when I was writing about, the rich people had telephones. It was not a problem for Cornelius Vanderbilt to pick up the phone and say, have my private car hitched to the train. I'm gonna be there, to, I'll take a cab to the train tonight, and I'll be in Newport tomorrow. But he could call the bishop because the church paid for the bishop's mansion and his phone. But when Julius Stewart gets to Paris and he wants to hook up with his friend, who's a painter who he knows is in town, he, he goes to, to the bar that he knows that the painter frequents and he writes a note to the painters, if you're in, come over for a drink and he, hands, he pays the kids to go, you know, run the message to the guy's house because he wouldn't have a phone. I'm here at three o'clock, I'm gonna be here till four, I, you know, you don't have time to sell a telegram or the expense. Okay, here is a great, what they call finding aid, WorldCat. WorldCat is your online book search and this will tell you the only biography written, by, written about Julius Lank Stewart. And here's where you can find it. It's in the Beverly Hills Public Library, Los Angeles Museum of Art, and the Huntington Library. Now, I could do interlibrary loan for these. I could walk into Santa Monica Public Library and fill out a slip, pay my dollar, and wait three weeks, and it would come by UPS. Or I could drive there. But, I mean, if this is in Rhode Island, guess what I'm going to do? Now, if I can go to this place, if I can go to this place online, I can probably find an index of their holdings. If not, I can call them. But this is looking for what is called ephemera. Now we're getting into the really interesting stuff. This is how I found the diary entry from Julius LeBlanc Stewart where he signs su Sunday. Okay, that's in the Smithsonian. This is not stuff you're going to find in a Google search. It's not stuff you're going to find in a book. It's papers. But everybody's papers family papers, whatever, if they're a significant person, that stuff is in storage someplace. In an institute, I mean, the Reagan Library, good example, okay? All his papers. Anything he wrote on the back of a napkin is probably in the Reagan Library. Every one of those places has got what's called a finding aid. It might be available online, or you might have to call the place, and if they don't have a researcher who will help you gratis, they may refer you to a professional researcher who's got access to the place, but they'll charge you on an hourly basis to go in and look through the finding aids and see, you know, this is what I'm looking for. Once you find the finding aid, you're going to find a citation, the collection name, 
the Reagan Library, the Reagan Presidential Papers, the storage location, room number three, bin number, you know, something, the box number, it's actually going to have a box number. It's going to have an item number because everything's serialized. There's no, there's no Dewey Decimal System for piles of crap, okay? The medium, whether it's paper, microfilm, if it's microfilm, it might be easy to get because they can, they can send you a digital like this via email, but they'll, they'll charge you for it. Every, everything's going to have accession method. Email us a request, request online, fax us a request, going to reply with how long it's going to take the, them to get it and what the fee is going to be. Make sure that when you get the fee, it's not just an access fee, it's also a reproduction fee. Because you may want to reproduce it or you may want to quote from it. Just make sure that you cross that little permission bridge right then because it's really wasted effort to have to go back to all these places. And yes, allow time. These people, that's all they have to do, but then again, they gotta make a job out of it. Julius Blank Stewart's father was not only a sugar plantation owner, he was also an art dealer in Paris. That's how they got there. So he said to his father, uh, and he was one of the younger, younger children, because his father wanted somebody to manage the sugar plantation, and he sent them there actually a couple of times. But he said, Dad, I wanna be a painter. And his father said, what? <laughs> and you know, the guy's richer than God not as rich as Vanderbilt. They had grand houses, they had summer houses, you know, relatives with places in Newport. And he said, okay, be a painter, just be their best there is. Like, as if you could. The thing was that in 1889, when Julius LeBlanc Stewart went to exhibit at the Paris Universal Exhibition, which was the first place the world saw what? The Eiffel Tower, 1889, the tallest and it was supposed to have light on the top to light the whole city of Paris. It didn't exactly work out. The painting is actually public domain. Uh, in the United States, it's author's or painter's life plus 70 years. In France, it's author's life or painter's life plus 100 years. When I first started this quest, it was not considered public domain. If I wanted to use it back then, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art would have charged me a fee. But, but it became public domain, and I confirmed that back with them right before I published, and they said, no, go ahead. It's tricky. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. I play one on TV. Or I, reserve, I express really reserve the right to play one on TV. That's it. There is a school of thought, which is not held by Wikipedia and the people who, where you'll find a lot of public domain stuff. There is a school of thought that is mostly held by private institutions that says if it's a rare thing, and it's not available to the general public, and we take a picture of it, that there's a new copyright that's created on that date. And then they will try to sell the thing to you. That map I showed you of Ochre Point, actually in the book, there's a color version of it. It's not in color in the book, but the Historical Society told me, you can't use that because that's a search request that we just sent you a Xerox of. Well, they sent me a Xerox of a public domain document. But they said, no, you, you can't use it because it was from our private collection. No, you have to do a formal request. Legally, I don't think they're in the clear. Okay? I mean, I think they're wrong. But I did it their way. And then I sent a formal request in. They sent me a tinted thing where they had taken a photograph and then they had tinted it like, oh, it's original. <laughs> well, we'll tint it up. And then they charged me. All my stuff was public domain, but they were the only source that actually charged me for using public domain material. So check. If you do a Google image search and you click on the image, it will probably tell you the rights holder. Often, especially on WikiImage, it'll give you their opinion as to whether it's public domain or whether it's restricted domain. But as a general rule, if it's in a book, write the publisher. Because the rights and permissions department has to keep files on everything that they print in the book. So they'll say, we don't own the rights, Gerald Everett Jones does. Okay, so, and then here's how to get in touch with them. Or they'll say, we'll handle the request because that's what permissions departments do. Or if it's a museum, every museum has a rights and permissions department. Public figures in general, you don't have to have permission to talk about them. Unless you're using the image of a celebrity, then Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley, their estates own their, there's a separate law that covers the exploitation of a celebrity's image. So be careful about that. Historical figures, you can say whatever you want about Courtney S. Vanderbilt, he's gone, okay? He was a, and he was a public figure in his day. I made up an entire scene between Cornelius Vanderbilt and his son. 
fictionalized biography, if you will. Deceased persons, even if the, in recent times, you don't worry about defamation with deceased persons. You don't worry about getting releases from their estate because they're gone. But the rights to their life stories, that could be something different. If they're the main character, you might want to pay attention to that. You might want to talk to their family and say, can I get the rights? Definitely living private persons, if they're not a public figure, if instead I wanted to write Bert's life story and make him the star of my book, as far as I know, you weren't in the Los Angeles Times last week, right? Okay, so you're not a public figure. There are certain standard things that get promised and certain standard protections for you that they're going to help you get any releases that you need. They're going to be the technical advisor. And again, you know, not, not, not intended as legal advice, but types of permissions, intellectual property right, quoted use of something that is within copyright or an illustration, you not only need to get permission, but you need to get the exact credit line that the copyright holder wants you to use in your caption or in your, you know, in a novel, you don't do it in line in the text. You put it in the back in, a, in your, you know, references or you put it on your copyright page. The wording of that, here's the catch there. If you don't get permission and then you still credit them, but you don't use the words that they told you to use, they know you didn't get permission. And they'll ask you for a copy as a follow-up. We want to put in our we want to put your book in our research library. Yeah, we also want to make sure that you quoted us the way that we told you the way that we're allowing it. So life story rights we talked about. Releases are subordinate to life story rights. If you have minor characters who are also living, it may be appropriate to get waivers or releases from them for, you know, use of their quoted material or whatever. If you're writing a main story about somebody's life in the legal agreement, you can say that that person will assist you in getting the subordinate releases and waivers. The other aspect, errors and omissions, this is a long topic. There's actually insurance for writers, and I think it's very worthwhile. Also, that applies if you've got a website and you happen to infringe, you know, you use somebody's photo and they say, that's my photo, and you take it down, as you're supposed to do, but they say, no, I'm still damaged. But also, you can make sure that errors and omissions clauses are in your publishing agreement with a publisher so that their errors and omissions is like an umbrella for you. Maybe not complete, but if that language is in there, it helps, creates a little firewall between. So then document, 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 everything. But I would also say, if you're documenting by email, that's great. That's a good way to document. But understand, Outlook has had several different versions since I started out. Some of my old Outlook files, files are unreadable. I had to get some third-party software that would read old Outlook files. And then I printed them out and, you know, to make, make sure that I had them. News at 11 is what they say in the movie business. Uh, when you've got a television movie, they want the news at 11 angle. And what would you have to talk about? All historical stuff is about today. How many people have seen Peaky Blinders? Netflix. It's a little bit violent. I, I'm not saying I recommend it, but it's a good example of what cable series have done. The cable series are the new novels. And when I say everything's about today, this is about Birmingham, England in 1819. World War I had just ended. The men, the characters, are returning war veterans. There's no jobs. Tommy, the main character, is a war hero turned gangster. The inciting incident is a theft of guns that were owned by the British government bound for Libya for the next war. And there's a failure of the political order and a certain film noir cynicism about is anybody's future going to be happy? Why would anybody now care about stuff like that, right? <laughs> okay, so practically speaking, you don't actually go out and write a cable series. Cable series is a new novel, in my opinion, and the good news is that things don't have to be foreshortened and adapted and cooked down and readers digestized to become a feature film. It's more like an episode is a chapter, and each one has a cliffhanger, and yeah, there's three or five episode miniseries, and then there's seven episode seasons, and you know, 13 episode season and multiple seasons. You don't go out and write a cable series. But your novel, or even your nonfiction, might be turned into one. I think this is good stuff to watch. 
to see the kinds of character development because when you can develop a character over 13 episodes, you've got a much richer arc. And it could be like this, but you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of this, which Hollywood used to say it hated, talking heads, a lot of exposition scenes, a lot of character-driven stuff, where it's a disagreement about action, ends with a disagreement about emotion. Where do we go tonight? You never love me. You, everybody can write that scene, right? Where are we going to go? We'll go to dinner. You never, you never understood me. You never want to do anything I want to do. I will conclude with an example I highly recommend, even though it's not the easiest read in the world, but it's not a long book. Stendhal's The Red and the Black, French novel from 1830. One of the things that's really significant about this, it is referred to as the first psychological novel. That's because it's the first novel in the Western tradition where the characters talk to themselves. So internal monologue. All the stuff that Tony Bill said you couldn't do in a movie. You know, now, now everybody's doing it in a movie because movies are more like novels. We want to know what's going on in a character's head. First psychological novel, very interesting from that standpoint. But other thing also, very important for you as writers of historical fiction, or as readers, readers of historical fiction, is Stendhal says, buried in that book, that people who lived in Paris at the time, sophisticated people who read novels, were wiser than the people in the country. Why would he say that? The people in the country didn't read novels. And so all they really had was their Sunday school lessons or the Bible. There are moral tales there. There are more tales that say, that if you cheat on your wife, this is what will happen. But in Paris, there's Balzac novels where if you cheat on your wife, this is what will happen. Well, this might happen. This might happen. OK, I've seen now, because I've read novels, I've seen consequences, moral consequences of actions. Is you know that. That might feel good at the time, but that could be a really bad idea. OK, now that doesn't mean the people in Paris are any more, more moral, because they just find cleverer ways of cheating on their wives. But Stendhal is making the statement that literature informs our lives. And again, it's because, again, those forgotten stories, they're there in your subconscious. You can't divorce yourself from the fact that you're a creature of Western civilization. You're a creature of all those writers who went before. And if you're going to write a historical novel, you're going to contribute to that body of work. So if 10 people read you, 100 people will read you, somebody 100 years after you're dead, their, their, their behavior may be changed by what you do. And that's our show. You know, Get Published is all about self-publishing and self-expression. And that getting published and the ease of getting published these days is really all about exercising the First Amendment in this free society of ours. You know, what we need these days are more ideas. Even though we're deluged in, with information, we need more good ideas. And we need debate about those ideas. Book-length debate, not just snippets that are posted on social media, not just selfies and cute pictures of your pets, the things that you really think. And remember, because in self-publishing there are no gatekeepers out there, that is the good news and that is the bad news. So hire some good help. Perhaps you found that here. You may find it on the website, whatever you're looking for, whether it's an editor or a book designer or somebody to help you promote. But hire good help, get good advice, and by all means, please get published. The Get Published Radio Show with Gerald Everett Jones is produced by Runky Productions. Our producer is Lori Marple and your announcer is Bill Navarro. Music by Jason Shaw. You'll find links to support services on our website, getpublishedradio.com. So whether you're an author, a publisher, or a self-promoter, get help at getpublishedradio.com. And thanks for listening.